Thank you for giving me the honor to be here with you tonight. My story begins like this. As mentioned before, my name is David Spampanato. I'm a second year journalism student at Fordham University. I'm a son, a brother, a friend, athlete, coach, writer. On some Saturdays, I'm a WFUV sports radio host. I'm a baseball player, a catcher, despite my diminutive stature, who's the only player on the field to see the game from my perspective behind home plate. This is the part of my story that's pretty easy to see, pretty public. But like us all, there are parts that I keep closer, more protected. On September 11, 2001, I was a happy four-year-old whose world abruptly changed when my dad never came home from work. He worked on the 104th floor of the North Tower, the one with the point on top. The first building struck on that faithful day. His offices were above the crash that took out the stairwells, leaving them no with nowhere to go but up. It's difficult to imagine what that must have been like. I always wondered what my dad was doing in his final moments, but I imagined he was helping others because that's who he was in everyday life. Although he was a bond broker, he was also a teacher, a coach, a triathlete, and a great deal, and a great dad to my two brothers and me. So in these past 15 years, I find myself interested in the stories, people's stories, the experiences that make them who they are, that show their character, their core, their spirit, I am fascinated to know the story of Wells Crowther, who is living parallel moments from my dad. Their last moments on the 104th floor on top of the world in two different towers. I am grateful that this story was written to remind us that ordinary people were extraordinary heroes on that horrific day. Immediately after ex accepting the generous invitation to be here tonight, I did some extra research on the author who memorialized Wells' story. I was already a big fan. After all, he eloquently tells stories on ESPN, usually with a connection to a sport or a sports figure. And it's usually the story of the unsung hero or the underdog, the person who faced challenges with dignity. He tugs at your heartstrings and gets to the real human emotion, leaving the viewer with a lasting imprint. Therefore, it's only fitting that Tom Minaldi would eloquently tell the story of Wells Crowther and how he behaved on his last day, the day for which he'll be remembered. Tom Minaldi has been a national correspondent at ESPN since 2002, covering mainly golf and college football. Prior to that, he was a teacher and coach, just like my dad was, before working on Wall Street. I hope the students at Shadyside Academy in Pittsburgh were as inspired by his 2015 commencement address as I was. Among other honors, Tom Rinaldi was, won 15 National Sports Emmy Awards and six National Edward R. Muro Awards. He's also the 2016 recipient of Father Bill Atkinson's Humanitarian Award at Villanova University. He's with us tonight to speak about his New York Times bestseller, The Red Bandana, the story of Wells Crowther. It's my privilege to introduce to you, Mr. Tom Rinaldi. Thank you, David. I really appreciate that. I had a chance to, to share uh, with Karen and Victoria. I've been fortunate enough to receive a, a number of different invitations. Uh, it's one of the wonderful benefits of writing a book. But the invitation that was most easily accepted, and honestly, uh, with really the most spirit and happiness for me is this one. And I'll tell you why. There are a lot of reasons. Let's start with that young man right there. I should be the one introducing him. But because he's obviously been raised right and respects his elders, <laughs> it worked out this way. Uh, my brother graduated from Fordham University for four years a great passion of his was working and volunteering at WFUV. So there's that connection. This is a society dedicated to the wonders that our mechanics and craftspeople and tradesmen and women perform each and every day. The very people who built the Twin Towers, who cleared the pile, and then built one world trade, which stands in its spot. Uh, my father was a stonemason by trade his entire life. 
His father was a stone mason his entire life. I grew up in the house that my father built. I eulogized him in the church that he built. The work that's done and that this society represents has great and deep resonance for me and for my mom, who's in the front row tonight, Eileen. If you haven't been upstairs in this incredible place and this incredible structure, there are two pieces of steel that sit very simply, unadorned, with a very simple placard next to them. They're two pieces of steel from the World Trade Center. Simply, the placard says that these pieces of steel were bequeathed to the society. Who knows how many hands touched those pieces of steel before ultimately they came to rest right up there. Objects in and of themselves have no meaning. It's the meaning we grant them through the hands that touch them, the passion that goes into shaping them into what they represent. Symbols matter. A little symbol like that. Before I tell you a little bit about that, I want to begin with a question. It's not an optional question, unfortunately. It's a question that's already left its launch and it's making its way to every single person sitting in this room and everyone who's not. It's a question we're all going to have to face in our own way. This book tells the story of one young man's answer to this question. What would you do in the last hour of your life? Where would you be? What would it look like? Who would remember it? If you could know, would you want to? Would you receive that knowledge with dread or accept it with grace? Would there be a peace to be gained or one already granted? If you understood the mortal clock, what would you trade to gain another hour and then another after that? What prayer would you recite? What deal would you make? What promise would you offer for this not to be the end? Look upon the common fears of what your final hour might be. Take the typical conditions and likely circumstances. You know them. You've seen them. You've lost others you love to them. The ebbing mind or failing body, the loss of family and lack of purpose, the fact of pain of the regiment of medicine in a home not your own, in the prisons of old age, receiving the full force of its meaning, there might be a mercy in the dulling of your intellect. After seven or eight or nine decades, maybe the final hour would feel like reward. But imagine it's sooner. It's an instant from right now. It's the line after the line you're hearing. The decades haven't stacked like wood for the winter. The years haven't collected in enough albums on the shelves. You haven't reached any golden age or twilight time. You're not winding down or scaling back, not going gray or getting slow. You're not there yet. You're not close. You're not old. For you, legacy is a distant and irrelevant word. It's for obituaries and sports columns. You're 24. You're ready, you're young. The hours are all yours until the last one arrives. If you knew this might be that time, this could be the end. This may be the very last hour you have to spend. What would you do? 
And what if the hour, with all its horror and loss, its panic and shock, still somehow gave you a choice to fly from risk, to escape, to live? What would you do then in the last hour of your life? This is a story about what one young man did in the last hour of his life. When Wells Crowther was seven years old, on his way to church, he wanted to do what he had done pretty much his whole life, and that's do everything that his dad did. He idolized his father, Jefferson. And Jefferson was dressed prim and proper in his Sunday best to go to church services. And so, in his very first suit, Wells was dressed until he noticed something. He noticed a pocket square in his dad's suit pocket, over the breast. And he asked his dad, can I have something just like that? And dad went back to the bedroom, opened up the drawer, came back, but caught himself and thought, this is going to end up here. So let me grab something else. And at the last minute, he grabbed a red bandana. The dad actually liked blue bandanas himself, but he gave a red one to his son. And he carried it virtually every day for the rest of his life. The wonder of a child, a talisman on the way to church, a thing that looks like a trifle or a rag, but would ultimately become a signature for him. If you would, I'd like everybody to take a moment and think to yourself about September 12th, 2001. Close your eyes for a moment. I want you to think about where you were, how you felt, who was around you? When you started your day, the first people you saw, the first things you said, how you moved through that day, September 12th. There was a unity that the country felt. There was something that brought people together you can look upon it and say it was something awful and unspeakable and irredeemable. But if I ask you to go back for a moment, 15 plus years later, and consider that feeling, how much of it do we still possess? That unity, that purpose, that allowance for others, you can make the case that a lot of that has been squandered, that it can be hard to find. One of the reasons I think this story made the bestseller list in the New York Times for several weeks is because I think people connect with that unity and purpose and sacrifice, the sacrifice of one young man at 24. The 104th floor of the North Tower, where a child lost his father. The 104th floor of the South Tower, 131 feet of sky away. Wells Crowther was at his desk. The plane has already hit the tower. At the last second, the lower wing of Flight 175 tilts and explodes through the 78th floor sky lobby. If you'd indulge me, raise your hand if you ever pass through the World Trade Center towers. If you ever went up into the towers, anywhere near the top, Express elevators went to 78. 
They stopped there so people could get local cars. It was a natural collection point for people to go to the highest reaches of both the North and South Towers, Trade Center 1 and 2. One being North, two being South. Walls Crowther, on the 104th floor, felt the building shake. People had left. He stayed. He called his mother. The last word she would ever hear him say, she still has it on a cell phone from that day to now. She still listens to it. I saw his mom today. I saw his dad today. He made his way down. The only functional stairwell, stairway A. He got to the 78th floor and he encountered a scene of indescribable horror. People who one moment before were in conversation, were considering the shape of their day, their plans, and their lives ended. When the wing tipped, the wall exploded, and 10,000 gallons of jet fuel ignited in their space. Wells Crowther got down to the 78th floor and did not continue to go down. He entered that space in a clear voice with a red handkerchief that he had pulled out of his pocket. He covered his mouth and his nose and he implored people, help those you can help. Follow me. I know where the stairs are. And he proceeded down. He carried a woman across his back, down 17 flights. He got down to where the air was clear on 61 and made a remarkable decision. He implored those folks to continue down. And he did the opposite. He went back up. Back to 78. He led a second group back into the stairwell. The only thing that folks knew or could remember, the only trace of recognition, was the trifle that his dad had given him when he was seven years old on his way to church. No grand plan, no manifest destiny, no big gesture or speech. He faced terror and reacted. Peggy Noonan's question to Allison, which embarrassed her, Mom, how do you make a hero? And her inability to answer, Dad saying he came with the hardware already installed. But the truth is, when you consider in that moment what one young man does, where that response comes from, there's something ineffable, something unknowable about what's at the core of a young man like that. I wanted to share with you, if I could, something which is not in the book. We did 110 interviews for the book, interviewed 70 people. And at the, the end of the process, when the manuscript was done, myself and a researcher, Willie Weinbaum, we called every person who was quoted or who had given us an interview so that they felt comfortable, that their quotes were accurate and the tone was balanced and fair. But the two people who provided the most content were Allison and Jeff. And I had a conflict. I wanted so badly to preserve the moment where I could give them some tiny piece of their son back by putting this book in their hands. Yet I also wanted to be certain that they felt as though they were being depicted accurately and fairly. So we reached a compromise. I went up to their house for who knows how many times in Upper Nyack, New York, and I sat at their kitchen table and I read aloud to them for five hours. 
I read for three hours to Allison and two hours to Jeff. At about an hour and a half in, Allison reached out, took my hand. All she said was, I could never have heard this until now. Jeff wept for two hours. My mom, my family, my friends would ask me during the process of writing this book, does it end in an inspiring way or in a sad way? And I would always have the same answer. Yes. The answer is both. It is a book about a terrible day told through the lens of a single life lost. But it's also a book about, and my mom has heard me say this a hundred times in my day job. And Peggy Noonan touches on it. The, the endless and boundless wonder of human strength to bear up through loss, loss that is unimaginable, the worst loss you can imagine, your first child, your only son, in Jeff's view, the embodiment of his best friend, someone he talked to every single day from the day his son left for college to the day before he died. Every day. What good can come from that? And yet, through Allison and Jeff, the third act of the book shows you, through their discovery of what their son did, their determination to make something good come from loss. I want to leave you with one other moment. President Obama, after he announced to the nation on that Sunday night, another thing I'd ask you to close your eyes and consider where were you when the president at 1135 took to the national airwaves and told the country that Osama bin Laden had been killed. Jeff and Allison simultaneously screamed in their house, one upstairs and one downstairs. They ultimately ran to each other and hugged in disbelief that it could be true. Five days later, they met the president. The president knew about their son. They were thunderstruck by that. And they asked the president if he would sign a bandana. He wrote a simple phrase and then he signed his name. We won't forget Wells. When the 9-11 Memorial Museum was opened, and if anyone has not been there, I cannot suggest going there strongly enough. It's a deeply moving experience. When it opened, the president chose to speak about one person by name of the 2,997 whose lives were lost. It was the man with the red bandana not because he is unique, but because he is not, because he is us. Us on 9-11 and the best in and of us every day that has passed since. Is it a book about loss? Yes. Is it a book about strength? Yes. Is it a book about family and faith? Yes. It took 10 seconds for each of the towers to collapse. 10 seconds. And yet, the imprint it's made on our nation and on our culture will never be forgotten. 
This is not a story that attempts to, to make sense of what happened. It's a story about one family and the young man they raised and the choice that he made. To stand here in this room in a place dedicated for 200, more than 225, 30 years for the people that built this country and then rebuilt it and rebuilt it again. There's an, uh, such a great honor and humility in that. And I know that if Jeff Crowther were here and Allison Crowther were here, they would tell you what I'll leave you with that in this simple trifle, in this rag, there's a simple message. Go back up. In whatever you do, it's so easy to go down. But go back up and let this be your guide. I thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Sure, I'd love to. Any questions? Have you answered that question yourself? It's a question that I've uh, wrestled with and struggled with a lot. And um, I think the truth of it is, I don't think I could do what Wells did. Uh, and I'd like to try to rationalize it. Maybe some of us in this room as we ask ourselves, would you have something inside you to go back up, not just to save a group of people, but then go back up and do it again? And by the way, Wells made it to the lobby, as the book traces, and still did not leave. His remains were recovered, surrounded by FDNY firefighters. Maybe you think to yourself, could I do it? before I were married, before I became a father. But I'm forever a son and a brother and a friend and a lover to someone. And to forego all that. You know, I've had a lot of people ask me, do you, do you think he knew that he was placing his life in jeopardy? I absolutely believe that, but to a degree, it's beside the point. The point is, and the book touches on this, that once he saw the suffering on 78, he could not turn away from it. And if that's not something to try to live up to, I don't know what is. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I thought in, in reading the book, I, some of the, for example, the, the fact that his, uh, Wells' parents met could you, on September 11th, 1968, if you could touch on that, and also sure. Osama bin Laden, that was their 40th wedding anniversary, wasn't it? Yeah, so. and, um, Allison uh, is someone who has visions and premonitions, and this is touched on in the book, um, but there are, without question, just some powerful coincidences and and numerology at work, if you will. The very first date that Jeff and Allison had, a blind date, was September 11th, 1968. Each one respectively went back home, living at home at the time, to Allison's parents, to her dad, Jeff to his mom, and each reported, they swear on a stack of Bibles, I just met the person that I'm going to marry. The response from the respective parents is what you would have assumed. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Uh, bin Laden was killed 
on the 40th wedding anniversary for Allison and Jeff. Um, and again, whatever anybody's political leanings are, for Jeff and Allison, that moment held a tremendous power and meaning uh, in, in so many ways. As two people who are people of faith and who each have struggled with the notion of having to try, according to their faith, to forgive in the face of their loss. And that's another book in and of itself. Thanks, Victoria. Can I ask one more? Sure. And, and I, the imagery of, um, at, at, at work, uh, being kind of teased that he had the bandana at all, and he jumped up on the desk, and, and they said, what do you have that for? And he said... Wells would, uh, when Wells went to work, uh, ultimately, and as an equities trader, uh, on the 104th floor for Sandler O'Neill, uh, he started in research, sort of the back of the house, if you will, and he would carry that red bandana in his pocket and colleagues would absolutely mock him about it. What do you think this is, a farm? And how to do, how do you do, Wells? And those kinds of things. Uh, but he was kind of always that guy that would find the solution to a sticky problem. And when he did, he would kind of rub their face in it by taking the bandana out. And at one point, he waved the bandana around and said, with this... I'm going to save the world. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Of, of the people you interviewed, how many were actual survivors? So this is an, an interesting question. How many people did well save, which is an elusive number, and a number that we never name in the book. Uh, we know that Wells led two separate groups down. Uh, let me, if I could, talk for a moment about two of the people who we interviewed. Ling Young, who worked for the State Department of Taxation and who was so badly burned by jet fuel on the 78th floor that she referred to her own, her own burns as being cooked inside. She suffered thermal burns, which go beyond first, second, or third degree, uh, and was in such incredible shock when Wells led her group down the stairs. Ling had never been back to the World Trade Center site. It was so traumatic for her. And yet at Allison's invitation, when the memorial opened, President Obama spoke, followed by Wells' mother. And Wells' mother was introduced by Ling Young. Judy Ween, who Wells also led down in a separate group, has her own uh, remarkable story, uh, uh, and uh, much of it is contained in the book. Judy is a key to identifying Wells as the man in the red bandana. Uh, but Judy does not do any interviews. Her husband speaks for her, and uh, that seems to be an arrangement that is unyielding. Uh, Ling has, after speaking with us, uh, five years ago I interviewed Ling. Uh, she has never given another interview. And I think that's also an indicator as to, for those who suffered inside the towers and went through that horror, how present it still is and how traumatic. Well, one other note on that, um, the book does describe the scene on 78 through survivors and their accounts. It was interesting that Allison, one of the first things she said to Wells' mom after reading the book was how grateful she was for those descriptions, which really surprised me. And I asked her why, and she said, because for too many people, they only understand pictures of two towers falling and really have little idea as to what was happening inside them. And through the experiences of these handful of survivors, there's a greater understanding. Thank you for that question. I, I, I want to say on the 
subject of, of survivors, because this is, is very interesting. I sent out our lecture notice uh, about a week or so ago, and only to receive a note about, the, the, it was about the red bandana and that the lecture was happening, and I received a note from a student of ours, a graduate student of our Mechanics Institute that said, this is a, an incredible coincidence. My name is Rich Fern, and Wells Crowther le led me out of the South Tower. So, and of all the coincidences, and I have to say, Tom, you being here, David, and then to receive the note for, for the, from Rich Fern, I mean, that was really incredible. And again, this, I feel this night was so meant to be to have you here telling, telling this story. So thank you. Thank you, Victoria, very much. I appreciate that. Well, since Wells was a lacrosse player at BC, played hockey in high school, and then you know, for you as a sports guy, how exactly did you come across the story? So I, we first told this story uh, as a television feature on ESPN. My day job, quickly, is as a correspondent for ESPN. I essentially do five things. My mom has heard me say this 500 times. Pardon me, mom. Um, and it is college football, golf, tennis, human interest features across all sport, which is really you know, sort of the meat. Uh, of what I do, and the fifth thing is whatever they tell me to do. I think we can probably relate to that. Um, this obviously falls under the human interest category, and one of Wells' friends is a producer at ESPN who was bound and determined to tell this story. ESPN actually rejected telling the story several times. Figure that out. Uh, and then on the 10th anniversary, we aired it he asked me to be the reporter and writer on the piece. That's how I first learned about it. That's how I first met uh, Allison and Jeff. Um, the story is you know, widely available and anthologized uh, on the web if you just type in the man in the red bandana. Um, uh, Edward Burns, the, uh, the New Yorker and director and actor, narrates it, uh, and I think if you if you ever, I'd love it obviously if you read the book, but if you do and you want to see Allison and Jeff brought to life, uh, I think the feature vividly portrays them in their, in their pride and in their pain. That's how uh, we came across it. How did you not get wrapped up in their pain in telling their story? If, if you'll indulge me, I think this is a question that, and, and I, I re appreciate that question. Uh, if you'll indulge me, if it's okay, uh, again, in my day job, I want to share a story that we aired just last night on ESPN in answering this. Uh, raise your hand, and no offense taken here, believe me, if you have heard of Tom Brady. Okay, <laughs> okay, I never presume. So Tom Brady is uh, the most iconic player in the NFL right now. Uh, he's the quarterback of the New England Patriots. For those who don't know. Uh, there's a boy in Connecticut named Logan Schoenhart. And Logan has had a, a difficult time in his 10 years of life. Uh, early on in his life, he had a vision problem. His parents didn't know exactly what it was, and ultimately, they took him in, and they determined that he had a brain tumor, a significant brain tumor, in a spot in his brain which afflicts one in every half million people. Very uncommon. He went in for surgery. He's had six brain surgeries in his life. Each time the tumor has been cut away, it has returned. There's been one constant of joy in Logan's life through all of this. And it pains me to say this as a Jet guy, okay? <laughs> it is Tom Brady and the New England Patriots. So, Tom Brady's number is 12. It's Logan's favorite number. He loves the number. On the sixth brain surgery, you can't make it up. The specificity of human experience is boundless and wonderful. He asks the brain surgeon the day before the operation, sixth surgery, 
Would you carve Tom Brady's number 12 into my skull? What can it hurt? And the surgeon is stupefied by the request, but does it. Somehow, that image, that MRI image of 12 clear as day carved into Logan's skull plate makes its way to the most iconic player in the NFL. And Tom Brady sends a personal video message to Logan Schoenhardt, who is astounded and thinks, this can't be real. There's no way this guy sent me a personal video message. But he did. A month after he gets the message from Brady, the tumor returns. And it's inoperable. Nothing more can be done medically for Logan. He develops a bucket list with his mom and dad. Ride a motorcycle, go to Disney, fire a shotgun in the woods with his father. But number one on the list is number 12. And 10 days ago, he meets Tom Brady. There's a little bit of a photo op, but then Brady takes him away from even from his parents. And says, come with me. Let me show you around a little bit. Let's break it down. What are your thoughts on this upcoming opponent, etc.? We never ask Brady for an interview. We never hear from him in the story we tell, which aired last night on 12-12. So we tell the story before Monday Night Football. There are two moments, um, I count on my mom here because I know she saw the piece. There are two moments in the piece. One where his mom says, Logan, there's nothing more that can be done and you're going to die. She tells him that. And his response is, it's too soon. It's not long enough. I'm only 10. When I asked Logan what he wanted to say to his mom, he said, I want to tell her I'm sorry. His father, at the end of our piece, says, cancer will take my son but it never broke him. He was on the sideline last night. He predicted before the game it would be a tight game, one score, and the Patriots would win, and Martellus Bennett, their tight end, would play a key role. The Patriots were winning 23-3. to They won by seven. Bennett caught a key pass in the second half. It unfolded exactly as he said. On the drive back from Foxborough last night in the car, I cried. It was a great night for the family. But I cried. I cried interviewing Jeff and Alice and not in front of them. I feel like that's indulgent. But in my own space, my mom, my wife, they will tell you. And I think if you don't, there's something missing. I'm not saying you have to cry, but if it, and again, with my mom as witness, she could tell you the number of times I felt the pressure to tell the story the right way. When someone shares that, let alone when someone shares this. It's to try to always be truthful, but write it the way you would want your story written, at least as best we can. Again, I just want to say there's so much going on. It's the Christmas season. It's New York. I am so incredibly grateful for everyone who took the time to come out tonight. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. On behalf of the General Society, I want to express our appreciation to Tom for illuminating the most moving and inspirational story. Thank you so much, Tom, really. It was just, thank you, fantastic. And we also want to thank David for his wonderful introduction. And we would like to make a presentation to you both. So could we ask you, Tom, to come up first? So, and, and Tom, I'm really beyond words. It was uh, thank you, first of all, for, for telling the story of a, a great American hero and, and giving us so much to think about in our daily lives and these lessons will stay with us forever. So thank you for telling the story of Wells Crowther so beautifully. And on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, founded 1785, we are, express our gratitude to Tom Rinaldi, ESPN correspondent and author of The Red Bandana and Son of a Stonemason, <laughs> right? Yeah for his participation in the General Society Labor, Literature, and Landmark Lecture Series. So thank you. Oh, that is so nice. <laughs> thank you very much. Is, and Tom, and anyone who comes to our events knows that once, once you're part of the family, well, we just don't let you go. And you are the son of a stonemason, so. We, you, but now you're also a lifetime member of the General Society Library. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> cool. yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Before, oh, I'm, sorry, and Tom. Po Polly Guerin has signed a book for you um, for, as a, a memento. And Polly, has she left? Polly Guerin yeah, she, was here this evening. And she and, signed one for my mom, oh, too, which that, was very yes. nice. Yes, Tom Rinaldi. And Eileen. And Eileen Rinaldi. And thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And that's your poster. Uh, a little memento. Thank you so, so much, guys. <laughs> can, can, can I just say one thing real oh. quick? My mom loves when you get anything for free. <laughs> she loves that. Loves it. And David, thank you so much for your introduction. And I just have to say, on a very personal note, this means so much to me. I just want to come over because your mom is yeah. um, As the son of a dear, dear uh, friend of mine from high school, Lori Giolito Spempanato, this is so meaningful to me to present this to you so. Um, on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, founded 1785, we express our gratitude to David Spampanato, Fordham University journalism student and WFUV contributor for his participation in the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen Labor, Literature, and Landmark Lecture Series. Thank you, David. <laughs> Yes, I just, I want to remind you all that this wonderful book is uh, now available for sale and I think uh, Tom will sign a copy for you, a personalized copy. So I want to invite you now to join us uh, for uh, a, glass, a glass of wine and to stay for the reception. I'm sure Tom will also be happy to answer any other questions you have.